Success in life is generally the product of simple things that we repeat. Have you noticed that? I mean, success in life, it really is a matter of simple repetition. Think about people that, that do well financially uh, when they retire are typically people that have started early and invested regularly. It's not a matter of winning the lottery per se or coming across a, a big uh, inheritance. But, but success financially is typically a matter of just right decisions uh, over time consistently. And if one will do that, he'll be in a place of financial success. It's true physically. You can't make up for a lack of exercise or a lack of diet. You can't just decide at the end of the year, wow, I've not exercised all year long, so I'm going to exercise for two straight days and get all my exercise in. It doesn't work that way. You can't just decide that, uh, well, you know, I've not brushed my teeth for 364 days, so I'm going to brush my teeth all day on the 365th day, and I'll have healthy teeth. That's not the way it works. Now, success in life is a matter of daily repetitions. That's what business owners have understood that have franchised their business. You know, anywhere you go in the world, you can go to a McDonald's where the burgers and the fries will taste the same. Awful, okay? But, uh, <laughs> no, actually the fries are pretty good. Uh, we've been, uh, I've been to McDonald's all around the world, different places. They've learned that success is a matter of finding simplicity and repeating it. Finding simplicity and repeating it. The best Christians at Harvest Baptist Church aren't the Christians necessarily that have the most skill, aren't the ones that are mo the most gifted per se, not even the ones that maybe were the most emotional at a church revival or meeting. But the best Christians are those that have learned the secret of walking with the Lord every single day. They learn the secret of, of reading their Bible day by day of inculcating scripture into their lives, of memorizing victory verses, and little investments of time over time can make us successful in every area of life. We find that in Paul's ministry. We find that in the first missionary journey. We find that they had a certain methodology, that a certain way by which they would go into a city, that a certain way by which they would conduct ministry, and they never, never varied from that. Uh, for all the years of ministry, the Apostle Paul basically followed the same repetitive pattern when he would go into a place. There was the proclamation of the gospel. There was the, there was the exposing of religion and how religion in and of itself is really an enemy of, a barrier to the gospel. There's a proclamation of the gospel. There's an exposing of the the, the fallibility of religion. And then there was an, a, an intentional discipleship process. That's what you see. You saw that at Antioch. You saw that back in Jerusalem. You saw that in Samaria. You saw that in the regions of Syria and Cilicia. You saw that on the second missionary journey in places like Troas and Philippi and Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth. You saw it later on in Ephesus. You see, see that pattern in Crete. You saw that same pattern in Rome and all around the world. You saw that pattern, a simple pattern, a proclamation of the gospel message. And then a, an exposing of the fallibility of religion and man's systems. And then an intentional prolonged discipleship process. I call it the repeated pattern of ministry. Uh, that's how churches succeed. That's how people succeed. The repeated pattern of ministry. Father, help us to discover what that means. Help us, Lord, today to be those people that learn that success spiritually is a matter of staying faithful day after week, after month, after year. I pray that you would be the guiding factor in that faithfulness. Bless this message, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We know that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and his team 
are on, are, are on what we call the first missionary journey. Uh, Paul has been saved for a number of years. He, he's been serving the Lord for a number of years. But we're, now we're picking up his story. We're beginning to learn about him. We saw a snippet of his life back in Acts chapter 9 when he trusted Christ as his Savior on the road to Damascus. We learn a little bit about how he went to Arabia for some years and how he went to Jerusalem for just a couple of weeks. We, we know that he went back to Tarsus and was there in his hometown. We don't know much about what happened there, but he was preaching and teaching the, the Word of God. And then we know how that Barnabas went and found him. How that Barnabas brought him back to Antioch in Syria. How that Barnabas and Saul worked together there for a time. How that they went down to Jerusalem and spent some time helping with relief efforts down in Jerusalem. Only to come back to Antioch and there to teach along with other teachers in that church. And then we know how God led them. How that God called them by His Holy Spirit to leave Antioch of Syria. And to go on what we call the first missionary journey. In Acts chapter 13, we read about how Barnabas and Saul went to an island called Cyprus. There they preached the gospel. The Bible says they did it systematically. What did they do? They proclaimed the gospel message. What did they do? They, they exposed the fallibility of religion. Man's attempt to climb to God. The gospel is what God thinks about salvation. Religion is what man thinks about salvation. And they are diametrically opposed. And then they inculcated people with the truth in the discipleship process as they went from Salamis all the way on this side of Cyprus all the way over to Paphos on this side of Cyprus. And then they made their way north. There's that little sliver of the Mediterranean Sea. And they arrived at a port city called Italia. We don't know much about what happened there because they made their way very quickly up that river just a few miles, about 12 miles upriver. And they came to a place called Perga. They didn't spend much time there, but later on they were going to come back to Perga and preach the gospel. They made their way from Perga to a place called Antioch of Pisidia. We were there last week. We brought a message entitled, Paul's Podcast. What if we were to take all of Paul's messages and put them online somewhere? What message would we hear? What message would we know about that message? Acts chapter 14, that's the message. Acts chapter 13, I should say, that's the message. Uh, Paul preached the, fu the fullest example of a message by the Apostle Paul. We looked at it last week. Paul preached. He emphasized the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel. What happened? Some were saved. Because when the gospel is preached, people have to make a decision. You cannot be ambivalent about the gospel. You know why? Because the gospel, boy, it drives right down to your heart. The gospel tells you that you're bad and that God's good. The Bible tells you that you're insufficient, but that God's uh, salvation is sufficient in the person of Jesus Christ. The gospel tells you that religion will fail you, but a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, will help you to succeed forever. It's the gospel. And so when Paul preached the gospel at Antioch, uh, you couldn't be ambivalent. Some accepted it. It said, we believe. And others were uh, uh, rejecting it and said, we're antagonistic toward it. Some said, please stay. Others said, please go. And so Paul and Barnabas were literally kicked out of town. They left Antioch of Pisidia. They made their way east. They came to a place called Iconium. We read about it just a moment ago. Understand that while Iconium is, is not too far from from Antioch, it's, it's a world away as far as culture. In, in, uh, in Iconium, we have the, the Lyconian people. They speak a different language. Uh, they have a different religion. Paul comes here. There's no synagogue to which he can go and speak to Jews first. Uh, uh, there doesn't seem to be one at least. And so he, he just preaches in open air. And, and many were saved. There are Jews there. And uh, they trust Christ. And there are some Gentiles. And the Bible says a multitude of people receive the gospel. Again, when the gospel is proclaimed, some will accept. But some will reject, and the Bible teaches that some people rejected the gospel message, and, and now the Bible says the city was divided because the gospel will divide people. You can't be ambivalent about it. You can't be lukewarm about the gospel. You can't be in the murky middle. You've got to accept it or reject it. Only two choices. Only two choices. Yes or no to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the people of the city, the unbelievers of the city, are now jealous. They're jealous. Uh, they're politicizing the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. They're jealous about how the gospel has gained steam with so many. And they begin to work to deceive people. 
The Bible says they begin to work to countermand the preaching of Paul and Barnabas. They even get some of the rulers on their side. And the Bible says that they uh, hatch a plot by which they're going to kill Paul and Barnabas. They're going to assassinate them. Well, Paul and Barnabas find out about it and they leave town. They leave Iconium. They go to a place called Lystra. Lystra is going to be a town that we learn more about in Scripture because it's from Lystra that we uh, find a Timothy. Timothy, the, the disciple, comes from Lystra. That's where Lois and Eunice live. But as of now, we don't, don't know anything about Lystra. So Paul goes to town. He begins to preach at Lystra. The Bible says there's a lame man there. He, he's been lame since, uh, since he was born. He never has walked one day in his life. The Bible says that, that Paul heals him. Obviously, the Lord does the healing, but the Lord uses Paul, and that was not uncommon during the apostolic age for God to use healing as, as a, an example of uh, the power of the gospel. And so this lame man is healed, much like Jesus healed the man in John 5 at the pool of Bethesda, and based upon that healing, preached about himself. Much like uh, Peter and John healed that man uh, when they went through the gate beautiful there at the temple in Acts chapter 3. And because of that healing, they, they preached the gospel to many at Solomon's porch and thousands were saved. Uh, like that healing in Acts chapter 9 when Peter went to Lydda and there was Aeneas uh, who was a, a, a lame man and, and Peter healed him and it was good for the gospel's sake. And now here in Acts 14, uh, Paul meets this lame man and heals him. And it's a great, great illustration of, of God's power. What happens? Uh, the people of Lystra, uh, they're superstitious people. The people of Lystra, they're people that don't worship even one God. They worship many gods. Two of the gods they worship are gods named Jupiter and Mercury. And they erroneously assume that because Paul did this miracle that he must be a god and, and they must be gods. And so they said to Barnabas, he must be Jupiter. And to, uh, Paul, he's the speaker. He must be Mercury. These are the gods come down to earth, they erroneously assumed. And because of that, they began to uh, gather the people together and speak in their own tongue, the tongue of the Lyconians. And they got some oxen together and they got some garlands, some wreaths together. And they fully intended to sacrifice animals and to worship Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas found out about it. They said, oh, no, 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 no. Don't worship us. They rent their clothes. They ripped their clothes as a sign of humility and of mourning. And they ran into the people and said, no, we're men just like you are. We're not gods. We're just men that God is using. There is one God. And that one God created everything. And that one God is the God that you need to trust. And that one God is the one to whom you need to turn from all of your empty, worthless religion. Turn to that one God who's been good to you, who has fed you, has supplied for you. Or turn to the one God. Well, the Bible says even with that preaching and even with that uh, speech, they scarce restrain the people. Uh, people were so religiously affected, they, they could hardly believe it. The Bible says that some unbelieving Jews from Antioch, remember that's where they were kicked out of town. Some unbelieving Jews from, from Iconium, remember that's where they wanted to kill them, had now come to Lystra and they had riled up the people and deceived the people. And now the same people, think about this, the same people that wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas actually dragged them out of town and stoned Paul and left him for dead. Boy, you talk about the fickleness of religion. You talk about the fickleness of people. The same crowd that cried, uh, hail, Hosanna, cried, crucify him. People are fickle. The same hometown that said to Jesus, oh, you're our Messiah, when he wouldn't do a miracle for them, wanted to throw him off the cliff. The same Peter that said, I'll never deny you, cursed and swore that very night, people are fickle. And these people that had said, we want to worship Paul and Barnabas, now stone Paul outside of the city of Lystra. What does Paul do? He comes back to life. The disciples are there. They thought he was dead, but he wasn't. Can you imagine the injuries? Can you imagine the bruises? Can you imagine the sight he was? What did Paul do? He went back into the city. That's the last place I'd go. But he went back in the city. Why? Because Christians were there that needed encouragement. Christians were there that needed to know that God is greater than he that's in the world. And Paul went back to Lystra. And then he went to Derby. 
And so there are three cities there in Laconia. There's Iconium. He went there. They wanted to kill him. They went to Lystra. They thought they did kill him. He went to Derby, and what did he do? He preached the gospel there too. The repeated pattern of ministry. The repeated pattern of ministry. He went back to the same thing. Hey, it's about the gospel. It's not about your religion. You need to know what the Lord says and be discipled. The repeated pattern of ministry. He goes to Derby, and then from Derby, guess what he does? He backtracks. So now he goes back to Lystra where he was stoned and left for dead. Then he goes back to Iconium, where they wanted to kill him. Then he goes back to Antioch, where they kicked him out. He goes back down to Perga and preaches the gospel, and then goes back to Antioch of Syria and tells the church after three years of their first missionary journey, he tells the home church, wow, here's what God did. Wow, God was good. (laughs) What a guy. I love the Apostle Paul. I love Barnabas. I love the intrepid spirit. I love the pioneer spirit of these men. What can we learn? Here we are 2,000 years later. We're thousands of miles away. What can we learn? We can learn this, that God wants us to follow the same pattern. I call it the repeated pattern of ministry. You have your Bible open to Acts chapter 14. Let me give you three thoughts this morning real quickly. Acts chapter 14, the repeated pattern of of ministry. And notice with me, if you would, three thoughts right here from our message. First of all, there is power. Are you listening? There is power in the simple proclamation of the gospel message. There is power in the simple proclamation of the gospel message. You know, what I've detected in churches all across our country, and even across the world, is that we've left off the main thing. Like the church of Ephesus of old, we've become good Bible practitioners. We've become adept at decodifying our doctrine. We've become good at at putting in our procedures and our our policies and and our methodologies. And and, uh, we've we've stressed faithfulness and we've uh, stressed longevity and we've franchised our ministries. And and, uh, all of that's good in its place. But none of that it means a hill of beans if we don't keep the main thing the main thing. And like the church at Ephesus, they left their first love. And the first love is telling the world that Jesus Christ died upon the cross. He was buried. He rose again. Our first love ought to be to tell people that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The first love ought to be the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if he died for everybody and everybody, Everyone was dead, and now that we're alive, we ought to tell everybody that Jesus saves. That's what we did this morning in the choir song. That's why we erupted with such applause this morning. That's why we had to do something emotionally this morning, because there is no greater message than Jesus saves. I'm just telling you that the repeated pattern of ministry must be the simple proclamation of the gospel message. Sometimes we want to improve upon it. Sometimes we want to think, well, you know, people aren't just going to believe that somebody whom they've never seen went to a place they've never been, died for sins I will not even own, and then rose again and, is, and lives in a place I've never been to, and he wants to save me from a, a hell that I don't even know exists. I mean, who's going to believe that? Nobody's going to believe that Uh, humanly speaking, but that's why the gospel's powerful. Because when you speak the gospel message, it's always accompanied by the power of God. That's why the Apostle Paul said, uh, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Hey, the gospel message is invested with power. But when you speak the gospel, when you tell people that Jesus came, that he loves people, that he died upon the cross, that he rose again, listen, that might assault someone's uh, mental sensibilities. That might not make sense logically, but I'm just telling you, there's something about it. And God gets inside of a heart and says, what that message is, is it's true. And when I tell you that Jesus loves you, and when I tell you that Jesus died upon the cross for you, inside of your heart of hearts, you know it's true. Why? The gospel is powerful. 
back in apostolic days, God would give a signs of that power. The Bible says that he attested the gospel message with signs and wonders. The Bible says in Lystra, he showed the gospel to be strong by raising this lame man from the ground to leap and to walk and to praise the Lord and to God. The gospel is just as powerful today as it's always been. Why? It's accompanied by the power of God, the same God that made everything, the same God that can part seas and feed multitudes, the same God that can give the blind man sight and give hearing to the deaf man, that same God, that same power is yours when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, we can't improve on it. Last week I challenged you, give your testimony to somebody. Last week I challenged, many of you took the challenge, hey, tell somebody about the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm just telling you, the gospel has power. It's the repeated pattern of ministry. Wherever Paul went, he led with the gospel. Wherever Paul went, he proclaimed the gospel. There never was a, a place or a season or a situation where the gospel was not appropriate. The gospel is always appropriate. It's always necessary, and Paul always led with it. The simple proclamation of the gospel. It's accompanied by the power of God. It's accessible to every single human being. Jew, Gentile, pagan. We see all of them in Acts 14. Man, woman, rich, poor, healthy, sick. It makes no difference who you are, where you're from, what language you speak, what your gender is. Makes no difference. The gospel is for everybody. It's the simple proclamation of the gospel. Number two, what's the repeated pattern of ministry? I see, first of all, the simple presentation of the gospel message. Can I say this, number two? Religion, religion remains the primary barrier to the reception of the gospel. Religion, are you listening? Religion remains the primary barrier to the reception of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The greatest enemy of the gospel is religion. Now, I know that the Bible doesn't speak of religion necessarily negatively because pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We understand that, but understand religion in the context in which we use the word today, religion is man's attempt to climb to God. You'll never get there. Religion is what man thinks about salvation. And man's thinking about salvation is always wrong because man always gives himself more credit that he ought to give himself. But the Bible says this about mankind. The Bible says this about men and women and boys and girls. The Bible says we're all sinners. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. We are all gone out of the way. We are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. All we like sheep are gone astray. Everyone, we've turned to our own way. There's nobody that can say I am righteous before a holy God. What the Bible says is I'm wrong and God's right. What religion says is, well, I'm not as wrong as you are. What religion says is, if I try hard enough. If religion says, boy, if I'm faithful enough, if I'm good enough, if my good outweighs my bad, if I'm this denomination, if I, if I, if I say this, if I go there, if I do this, that's what religion says. And religion has always been the chief barrier to the reception of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We find it in Acts 14. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that Paul went and Barnabas, what did they do? They gave the simple proclamation of the gospel message. It was accompanied by God's power. They could see it. It didn't take a rocket science to see that, that their message has power. But some people didn't believe. Why? Because their religion was the lens through which they saw the gospel message. They couldn't believe because their religion had colored their thinking. Their religion had distorted their view of the gospel. They couldn't see it. Oh, they might admit that, that, that there's one God. The Jews admitted that. They might admit that there's one God. They might even admit that the Bible is true. The Jews admitted that. But they just could not come to the place that they needed Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They believed everything else. We believe, hey, 99%, we believe what you believe. We just don't agree on Jesus. Listen, if we don't agree on Jesus, there is no salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by, but by him. It's Jesus plus or minus 
nothing. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not Jesus and your good works. It's not Jesus and your baptism. It's not Jesus and, no, it's Jesus alone that saves. And what happened was, what happened was they gave a simple proclamation of the gospel, but religion got in the way. And these Jews said, nah, uh nah, uh Oh, but when you were talking about uh, Moses, we ab- agreed with you. When you were talking about uh, David, we agreed with you. When you were talking about the Scriptures and our fathers, we agreed with you. But when you said that Jesus is Messiah, hey, that's where we draw the line. And the religion of the Jews prevented them, prohibited them, precluded them from believing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Religion became the barrier. By the way, the religion of Lyconia became their barrier. When Paul went to Lystra and uh, there they healed that lame man and preached the gospel. The Bible says in verse 7, there they preached the gospel as they talked about Jesus. As Jesus showed his power in and through the healing of that lame man. Uh, There it was. There's the simplicity of it. There's the gospel. Just believe it. But what did they do? They superimposed their religion on it. Oh, well here's power. This must be Jupiter. This must be Mercurius. Because after all, that's what their religion taught them. You can read Ovid, the a Roman poet. He wrote a series of poems in a collection called Metamorphosis. And in that series of poems, he wrote a poem about uh, a couple named Philemon and Baucis. Philemon is the man. Baucis is his wife. They were an old couple. This is how the poem goes. This was a poem read by all the Lyconians. It was written 50 years before Paul ever showed up. It was a poem about how uh, the gods, Jupiter... And Mercury came down to earth disguised as poor human beings. How they went to Phrygia, which was a region just on the other side of Laconia. How they went to that place and they looked for a home to stay in, but nobody would show them hospitality. Until finally an old couple that didn't have much, uh, Philemon and Baucis, took in Barnabas and took in Uh, uh, Rather, Barnabas. There I go, mixing mythology in the Bible. Don't believe a word I say. Took in Jupiter and Mercury. And, and what, what Ovid the poet said is that Jupiter and Mercury destroyed the entire area but saved alive Philemon and Baucis. So now Paul and Barnabas come. And they heal somebody. And this man is walking and leaping and praising the Lord. And, and so what do the Laconians automatically think? Oh, this must be Jupiter. This must be Mercury. They superimposed their religious teaching upon what God was showing them in the gospel. Boy, religion. That's why it's so difficult to lead someone to Christ who's an adult that was raised in a religion. Why? Because their eyes have been so colored. It's been so colored. When I was leading my father, my father, I was able to lead him to the Lord two months before he died. It's an amazing, amazing thing. My dad was raised in a Catholic church and my whole family was. And there he found no hope and no peace. This is his own testimony. He said, I just didn't see it. I couldn't understand it. I never felt like I was good enough. They taught me that I had to be baptized in the Catholic church to be saved. They taught me that I had to be confirmed. They taught me that I had to take my first Holy Communion. They taught me that I I never had any peace. He said, when I was in ninth grade, I turned my back on religion altogether. For the next 40 years of his life, he was an avowed agnostic slash atheist. He would go to the Ayn Rand meetings back in the 1970s. He'd go to the Madeleine Murray O'Hare meetings. He thought that logic would carry the day. He thought that intelligence, an intelligent person would never believe in one true God. Say, Pastor Skelly, how did you witness to your father? Did you argue with him on some great intellectual plane? No, I I could never outsmart my dad. He was way smarter than I was. Say, Pastor Skelly, what did you do? Did you uh, show him a a line-by-line comparison of of creation evolution? No. Did you show him, you know, why the gospel uh, comes in a contradistinction to religion, even even the Catholic religion and, and and the Baptist religion or any religion for that matter? Did you show him? No, I didn't show him that. Say, Pastor Skelly, what did you do with your intellectually superior dad? I told him that Jesus loves him. I told him that Jesus is the Son of God that came to earth. 
and lived a perfect life. I said, Dad, he loves you. He died upon the cross for you. Because you're a sinner, Dad, so are all of us. You need to receive him as your personal savior. Dad, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to go to hell. Dad, if what I'm telling you is true, there's something on the inside of you right now saying, it's true, and you can't explain it. But it's true. I'm just telling you, the gospel has power. It has power over the intellectual. It has power over religion. It has power. Don't let religion cloud you. Don't let what you've always been taught. Hindu people love their kids. Muslim people love their kids. Buddhist people love their kids. Religious people love their kids. But just because someone loves you and has taught you something doesn't mean it's true. Put everything in the garbage if it doesn't line up with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Religion can be a barrier when it becomes a lens through which you view the gospel because then you say well okay I believe in Jesus but I've got to help him out I've got to do something I've got it's got to be Jesus plus my works no it's Jesus alone grace alone faith alone in Christ alone that's the message of the gospel but not only if you look back at our text Acts 14 not only is religion a barrier because it is the lens through which we see all things spiritual but I would say that religion is especially deceptive. Are you listening? Religion is especially deceptive because it is so close and yet so far from the truth. If I wanted to get you to drink poison, I wouldn't put poison in a cup. I'd put something you really like in a cup and put an ounce of poison. When the devil wants to mess up the human race, he doesn't pour uh, atheism in a cup, he pours religion in a cup and just adds a little bit, a little bit of poison. He makes religion so close it looks almost the same. And that's what happened here. The Jews, well, we believe 99% the same thing. Yeah, but you don't believe right about Jesus. Here was even pagan people saying, well, you know, we believe in the same concept. We believe that God comes to earth in human form. We believe that we ought to receive him. I mean, that's what they believed. They just didn't believe in the God of the Bible. They just didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, there was commonality, but commonality doesn't save us. Only Christ saves us. And so what was the repeated pattern of ministry? Jesus saves. That's the simple proclamation of the gospel. What's the repeated pattern of ministry? Religion is fallible. Religion will never save you. Your religion will actually keep you from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't let religion bind you. Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Accept the simplicity of the gospel message. And then thirdly and lastly, the repeated pattern of ministry. The simple proclamation of the gospel message. Religion remains the single greatest barrier to the reception of the gospel. Number three, discipleship. Discipleship is a prolonged and intentional process. Discipleship is the product of a prolonged and intentional process. What, 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 what did Paul do? Here's what he did. He went into town and said, hey, here's who Jesus is. Hey, what you believe in is wrong. Yeah, but we believe it. Doesn't make a difference why it is. Yeah, but we're religious. I don't care what you are. We're Jews. It didn't matter. We're Gentiles. Didn't make a difference. We're pagan. Didn't make a difference. It's not about what you used to believe. It's about Jesus Christ. So he proclaimed the gospel. He showed the fallibility of religion. And then he said this, okay, now that you believed on Jesus, now the work has begun. Now we've got to learn and grow. Now we've got to inculcate truth so that we're not deceived, so we don't fall by the wayside. So what did Paul do? He went back to every single city at which people had been saved. He went back to every single population center where the gospel had been preached, and he begins to line upon line and precept upon precept, teach them the truth of the Bible to inculcate the process of discipleship in their lives. Notice what it says in verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel, see, there's the way ministry begins. When they had preached the gospel to that city, Derby, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, now they're backtracking, to Iconium, to Antioch. What were they doing? Why did they go back? Why risk it, Paul? Because the Bible says they were confirming the soul's of the disciples. Not saving them again. You're only saved once. But once you're saved, you're a little baby. Once you're saved, you're just like a, an, an infant. 
And Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're on your way to heaven. Yes, you can't lose your salvation. But if you're going to be productive in this uh, Christian life, if you're going to grow in this world, if you're going to make a difference for the cause of Jesus Christ, you must receive food. You must grow. You must be discipled. So Paul comes back and confirms the souls of the disciples and exhorts them. See that? Verse 22. And exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So what, what is discipleship? I think, first of all, discipleship involves exhortations and examples. The greatest way by which you can be discipled when you're a little baby is to be encouraged and to have somebody to look to. That's the greatest thing you can do. Okay. Hey, you can do it. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, that's part of it. You're going to fall. You're going to fall. Get back up. You're going to fall. Okay, it's okay. No, it's not easy. Yeah, it is hard. Okay, but you can make it. We made it. Look at us. We're here. Look at us. Oh, we're not afraid. Look at us. Oh, we got persecuted. Look at us. Ex exhortation. To, if you're a new believer, the greatest thing you need is encouragement from somebody that's already been there. You need a mentor. Can I say this? If you're a, a mature Christian, there ought to be somebody right now. When I say this, there ought to be a name right now in your mind. Who are you mentoring? Who is it right now in your life? You're, are, you a, are you a believer? Do you know Christ? Have you learned that, that uh, I need, have you learned how to be faithful? Have you learned that the Christian life is bumpy and uh, we got bruises? Have you learned that it's an uphill climb? If you've learned that, who are you helping? Who are you coming alongside of? Or are you just kind of living your life like the Lone Ranger? Because a new believer needs exhortation and example. And if I were Paul, I would not want to go back to those cities. If I were Paul, I would not go back to those uh, lion's dens where people wanted to kill me. But there was something more important than the danger to his own life, and that was the new life of new believers. Who are you helping? New believers need exhortations and examples. But not only do they need exhortations and examples, they need truth and teaching. Notice what it says in verse 23. The Bible says, and when they had ordained them, so they're going to these cities, they're exhorting, they're providing examples. But when they had ordained them elders, pastors, in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord on whom they believed. So what else do new believers need? New believers need exhortation. They need someone to come alongside and say, hey, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to church. Hey, listen, hang in there. Hey, I know it's tough. Let me pray with you. Hey, let me tell you my testimony. They need exhortations and examples. They need truth and teaching. What did Paul do? He went back to Derby. He went back to Lystra. He went back to Iconium. He went back to Antioch. He went back to Perga. He went back to these cities. Why? Because they needed churches. They needed to go to a place week by week and month by month and year by year where they could hear the faithful teaching and preaching of God's Word. Can I say this? If you're a new believer or an old believer, you need church. You've got to have it. You've got to get to a place where the body of truth is being proclaimed. You've got to be faithful to a place where you're going to learn and grow in the Word of God. That's why I would take advantage of every opportunity at my local church. I wouldn't just come to Sunday morning service. I'd get myself into adult Bible class where I'm learning the Bible too. You never stop learning the Bible. Man, I'd make every effort to come to the services that are provided. Why? Because we need it. We've got to have it. And that's what Paul did. He risked his life to show people the importance of the church. I want to come back and make sure everyone has a godly pastor. Everyone has a faithful teacher. Everyone has a local church. Why? Because we need truth and teaching. We need exhortations and examples. We need faith and fellowship. Notice what it says at the end of verse 23, and I'll be done. The Bible says, and they prayed with fasting. Watch this. They commended them to the Lord. To commend means to place alongside of. In other words, in other words, Paul said, we can't stay. We can't be here forever. So what we're doing now is we're providing a local church for you. And we're providing an example for you. And we're exhorting you. And we're saying, listen. Stick with God. He's the one you believed on. And stick with God. He's the one you trusted. Stick with God. He's the one that's got you. 
Stick with God. He's the one that's at the other end of every one of your prayers. Stick with God. In other words, you put your faith in him for your soul's salvation. Now put your faith in him every single day. You put your faith in him as the one that loved you enough to die for you. Now put your faith in him as the one that loves you enough to be by your side every single day of your life. Uh, Have faith and fellowship with God. That's what new believers need to know. That there's no special uh, system. There's there's no special pecking order. There's no special language you use. Listen, if you're a child of God, you have as much access to God as I do or anyone else does. There's faith and fellowship with God. So this morning we, we had a great service. I'll tell you, I was just on the edge of my seat knowing what our choir was going to sing. I loved it. We had a bigger choir than usual. Some people jumped in and said, well, we want to be a part of that. Our orchestra was packed out. Our special music was spot on. The room is full. I think part of the reason for that is because I announced last week (laughs) we were going to have a special mystery guest. Some of you Sherlock Holmes people figured it out. He said, ah, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. (laughs) Can I tell you something? We didn't have a special mystery guest. We had the guest. And he's here every week. Years ago, a church in Washington was so excited because President Teddy Roosevelt was to come. Scheduled to come and people were abuzz and the church was packed and every seat and every pew was just stacked with people. That morning, a presidential emergency arose and Teddy Roosevelt didn't come up. The preacher got up to the lectern that morning and he preached a message entitled, God is still here. And can I say this this morning? God is still here. And we need to engage in sometimes the mundane. Can I even say this? Sometimes even boring. But we need to commit ourselves to the pattern of ministry. We're proclaiming the gospel. Religion is wrong. God is right. And we're going to engage in a purposeful, prolonged, intentional pattern of discipleship. Why? Because we want to be the people that are proclaiming. We want to be the people that say, that's wrong, this is right. And then we want to train those people that trust Christ to be those people. And for thousands of years, it's been happening. And we get to be a part of it.